We hear a lot of questions about the role of meat, not only in human health, but in the health of our environment. Well, this week's guest says it's a necessity for both. Join me as I talk to Diana Rogers about her book, Sacred Cow, co-authored with best-selling author Rob Wolf of The Paleo Solution and their upcoming documentary. You're going to want to see this. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger Hunt Feast. With me is Diana Rogers, registered dietitian, licensed nutritionist, and co-author of the book Sacred Cow with Rob Wolf. Diana, welcome. So glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited. I love the book. I'm looking forward to the documentary based on the book. If you guys haven't seen it, well, you probably can't. There we go. Now I can put it in my background. It is... Uh, well, see, this background is kind of messing me up, so I'm kind of screwing this part up. But um, it looks a lot like... <laughs> The, the background behind Diana, if you're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, um, man, there's a lot to cover. This book is so rich from nutritional to environmental and mm -hmm. the benefits of meat and the, the just ruminants. Okay. So uh, in general, um, the benefits to, our, to our, our bodies and our planet. So I'd love to just dive right in. Give us a little bit about of your background because you had your own health story uh-huh yeah actually work. yeah rob and i both have very similar health stories um and and similar food sensitivities um mm -hmm. and I, you know a lot of people i've noticed end up in this space because of a personal health issue uh so i had undiagnosed celiac um and i found out when i was 26 but it explains why as a kid i I mean, pretty much just everything went straight through me um, and mm. I didn't really absorb much. Um, I was really underweight as a kid and uh, low muscle tone. And um, Rob and I both also had kind of uh, some weird like reading issues, just, you know, weird neurological stuff. And still when I'm having a gluten attack, um, I can't think properly. Um, I, can't, mm. I have a hard time reading and a hard time you know, just that brain fog is pretty intense. Um, so, uh, so going gluten free definitely made a big difference, but my blood sugar was still like on this crazy roller coaster and I couldn't figure out why. And I was pretty sure I was diabetic. I kept asking my doctors to, you know, test me for it. I kept coming back in like the normal ranges, but I knew there was something wrong with me because if I didn't eat like every two hours, I would like start sweating, tunnel vision, um, like wow. just crazy, crazy, like hypoglycemia type symptoms. Um, and so uh, I decided to learn more about nutrition actually um, after I had my second kid. Um, so my undergraduate degree is actually in fine art and um, I was in marketing for a long time for food marketing. I mean, I've always been interested in food. Um, but uh, so I, I went back really just to learn like how to fix myself. Uh, so I attended Nutritional Therapy Association and became a nutritional therapy practitioner. Mm. And uh, towards the end of the program, we had to read a book with a diet prescription in it, follow the diet prescription and then write about our experience. And so mm. I picked the Paleo Solution. It had just come out <laughs> um, and it totally changed my life. Like hmm. totally my life went from like black and white to color. So um, wow. I no longer had to eat every two hours. I could even skip lunch and be totally fine. Um, I didn't think about what I was gonna cook for dinner all day long. I mean, I was really food addicted and I was eating healthy too. That's the other thing is like, I was gluten-free but I was like really into my lentils and my rice and um, my you know gluten-free granola bars, but I, thought I was doing everything right. Um, gotcha. And uh, anyway, so um, I, I opened my nutritional therapy practice and I just noticed every single person seemed to benefit when I also gave them a paleo type diet. Um, and so I wanted to make this my career. Um, and that's when I decided to go back and become a registered dietitian. So it took me seven years um, part-time as a mom. Um, and it was really grueling to have to go through that standard, uh, dietetics program. I'm sure knowing what uh -huh. you knew at that point. Yeah. yeah. That's... Mm -hmm. So you didn't unlearn what you, what you learned in school. You had mm -hmm. to, you knew it and you had to go back and put yourself through it and actually regurgitate it. Like you believed it. Yeah. 
oh, how painful. Yeah, like whatever my gut instinct was to answer, I had to answer the opposite of, oh, of you know. Um, but I did it to get the credential um, to work more with the medical community um, mm. and to really have that credibility for more writing and, and all the things I wanted to do. So um, so now I can take insurance. I have a uh, you know, nutrition clinic. Um, I see people part-time and mm. with the other half of my time, I am sort of this like cattle avenger. So I, um, I go out there and, and try to dispel the myths around grazing animals. And so the other half of my story is environmental. So um, I worked on farms uh, as a, a college student. Um, I've, I've been living on or working on farms since then and um, have, it's always been organic farms um, and you can't grow vegetables without animal inputs. You just can't do it. And so as I've noticed the dialogue in the nutrition world and environmental world uh, shift to, you know, we, we all are eating too much meat. Um, we all need to go vegan or vegetarian in order to save the planet or clearly eat less meat. Um, nobody seemed to be really pushing back against that um, and talking about how cattle aren't really the problem. It's, it's not the food, it's how it's produced. And we've got major food production issues. And um, there's another side to this story. And so I had been begging Rob to write the book Sacred Cow with me for a long time. Uh, he kept saying it wasn't the right time to do it. It wasn't the right time to do it. I think now is a great time to have it out. Yes. Um, people got to see what happens um, to our meat system when it gets uh, interrupted as it did during COVID. Right. Um, and then we, so the book came out in July. And then at the same time, I also made this documentary film because how many people are really going to pick up this book and read it? Like if I want to reach young people, the way to do it is through film. I mean, they're showing these vegan propaganda films in public schools and I wanted a piece to be the counterpoint to that. And so um, I did a crowdfunder, I raised a little bit of money, I got started and then um, you know, shot some more, raised more money. And it was a very long process. It was a lot of fun. It was really hard. And um, the film is finally done. Yeah, we are releasing it um, November 22nd to the 30th on sacredcow.info, just as a preview to the community. Okay. And then it will be on the mainstream platforms this winter. So we're just negotiating all those um, deals right now with um, all the awesome. all the people. Yeah, with the Netflix and the or the various the various streaming platforms. I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. That's fantastic. I look forward to that. Uh, so I can recommend it to everybody. Um, and I've definitely been posting about your stuff, like stories and you know, Sacred Cow, and you know, getting people to sign up to see the preview who are aware now. Uh, it's it's um, near and dear to my heart. I try to get people to eat a protein centric diet and it, and there's always a, the, the, the odd tilt of the head, the furrow brow, the like, because it seems so contrary to what the message is that's coming out of Harvard, out of WHO, out of, you know, um, really just the mainstream, all the plant-based, whatever you want to, you know, call it. And then the influencers, which really confuse people because they're, they've been there for all of six months and they're saying plant-based diet and look how wonderful I look in a bikini. And so it's, it's very um, image driven with people who have, you know, they've been plant-based for six months. They have no idea, what, you know, or whatever. And it's, it's not, there's no, um, there's no roots to it, so to speak. I mean, to, to, to put it bluntly, there's no, there's no depth. And what you guys have done has a lot of depth. And I just can't wait to dig in here and, and share it with people because like you said, you know, a book, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna draw people to the book, to the movie. This is, um, it's really complete what you guys have put together. I think it's nose to tail, so to speak, from, from nutrition to, um, to environmental. So let's, I mean, it's, I guess you guys start, let's go with the way the book does. You guys start with the health side of, I mean, the big fear is, is meat healthy? And does it cause cancer? Does it raise the risk of disease? So let's, let's start there. Maybe. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we, we both clearly eat meat. And so we put that 
right up front. This is not, you know, e even the film is not an investigative journalism piece. It's an advocacy film. Uh, the book is also an advocacy book. It is not, um, you know, plants versus meat. And um, we actually talk in, in both pieces about how it's the wrong argument. Um, it, it isn't plants versus meat. And that's, that's not what it's about. Right. Um, so we're not looking to sway any ethical vegans over because they're pretty convinced, but we do believe that you can't have an intelligent ethical discussion about how it's wrong to kill animals if you don't fully appreciate the nutritional contribution they make and the environmental argument for why um, animals are so critical to a sustainable food system. Absolutely. So, um, so the nutrition argument is pretty clear and straightforward. Uh, meat is healthy, period. It is a healthy food. Uh, the studies against meat are observational studies where they look at large populations of people um, and look at disease in the one group versus the other group, and then they're drawing conclusions. Um, vegetarians are much more likely to shop at health food stores, to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, to do yoga, to meditate, to sleep you know, better. They're less likely to smoke and drink. All of these lifestyle factors kind of go hand in hand with the vegetarian vegan lifestyle. Right. Um, so then when you compare these people to a typical meat eater who might go to tailgate parties, uh, you know, they're not just eating a burger, they're having it with a bun and the sauce and the large fries and the sugary soda and, you know, the deep fried apple pie that goes with it. So is it the burger or is it all that other stuff that they're doing? Right. Is it, you know, the drinking and the smoking and all these other things? And so when you um, eliminate the confounding factors, so when you adjust for lifestyle, there's no difference at all in longevity between meat eaters and vegetarians. And so they, they have done studies where they've adjusted for that and they've found no difference. Um, they've also done studies looking at shoppers of health food stores. So therefore kind of adjusting for that health food shopper lifestyle and they've found no difference in longevity at all. So um, the, there is one case, uh, the WHO did come out with bacon causing colon cancer. And what they found mm. from observational studies was a 18% um, increase in risk if you were to eat five slices of bacon every single day for the whole rest of your life. Uh, but what uh, they were sort of comparing that to cigarette smoking and- um, Oh my so gosh. It, <laughs> yeah. Um, so with cigarette smoking, there is a 15 to 30 times more risk of cancer. Yeah. Um, with the bacon, it's an 18% increase, but that doesn't mean it's an 18 times higher. That's less than two times. And so right. it's statistically irrelevant, uh, an 18% increase in any risk of anything. So your, your general chance of getting colon cancer out in the general population is um, 5%. So that's like you and me, we have a 5% chance. If you were to eat five slices of bacon every single day for the whole rest of your life, your chance goes from 5% to 6%. Gotcha. So anyway, it's- um, And that's an 18% increase? Well, oh. yeah, between 5% and 6%, it's, a, it's an 18% increase in risk, but it's like, anyway, so people don't understand the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. Right, um, that's what that is. So that's the relative risk, but the absolute risk is really one. <laughs> it's, it's it's nil yeah it's nil it's, it's non-existent and it's did they would they how did they how did they eliminate other co-founding like um con, excuse me co-founding confounding um variables like what you already mentioned lifestyle variables yeah not all the studies did so uh <laughs> i mean so, okay yeah, and um, and and then there's uh, another anomaly where um, you know when you look at Asian populations that eat more meat, um, uh, like Hong Kong has a really high meat intake and a very low cancer and heart disease, and so um, it, there's just there's no meat to that argument at all. And um, and then we did look at the protein recommendations by uh, out of the um, RDA of protein and it is way too low. And so um, right. as a clinician, I actually advocate that people try to get about double the RDA of protein at least. Okay, so for, for the listeners, let's um, give us some 
more hard numbers on that. Like, is it yeah. per, grams per pound are you going by or kilos or what do you? Anywhere from a, a, a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight okay. um, to even a gram per pound. It, it just depends on what your goals are. Um, but what I usually start women at because they come into my practice eating like 30 grams of protein a day right. or less. It's crazy. And they're wondering why they don't have energy and why they gained all this weight. And so I bump them up to at least hundred grams of protein per day. And so people need to understand that doesn't mean hundred grams of meat. That's hundred grams of protein. And so you can, um, there's some really great apps. My favorite one is chronometer and you can go on there and, um, you know, you enter, uh, six ounces of chicken breast and it'll show you how many grams of protein that equals. Yeah. Um, but that's, that looks a whole lot like four to six ounces, closer to six ounces of animal protein three times a day. Right. It's right around a pound ish, depending on the, the meat that you're eating, whether you're having mm -hmm. beef or fish or chicken, it's give, give or take around a pound of, of meat. And, um, which a lot of people would, would, would think that's a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it be, if, the, like you said, they're used to eating 30 or maybe 60 grams a day and they're thinking, how do I, but if you were to, if they were to take a really look at how they eat, they're probably snacking and nibbling throughout the day on garbage anyway, yeah. because they're not satisfied. They're, they're got cravings or nibbling. And if they were to eat that much protein, I think they'd, they'd probably find their, when you say their cravings would probably in hunger on uh, outside yes. of mealtime would greatly be greatly. Totally. Diminished. Yes. So protein is the most satiating macronutrient. And then there's also the protein leverage hypothesis. So it's the idea that um, the more protein you eat, the less likely you are to reach for nutrient poor food. Um, and, you know, it's funny when I tell men to eat more protein, they like run out the door and do it right away. done with that sentence, right? <laughs> yes. Go get me a steak. But women have a really hard time with that. They feel like it's gluttonous and they're just really, you know, it's like getting a woman to lift weights. It's, it's really, it's, it's too masculine. It's too gluttonous. People are uncomfortable about how animals are raised in this country. And I get it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if, if we're going to have a population that's not obese, we need to increase people's intake of nutrient dense protein. And meat is the best source of that animal, animal flesh. So in other words, the nutrients are more easily assimilated than yeah, in plants. Yeah. So in, um, when there's a plant-based nutrient and a animal sourced nutrient version of that nutrient, it's the animal version that our bodies prefer. Mm -hmm. There's less, less to convert, I guess, less to. Exactly. Yeah. It's more bioavailable from animal sources than from plant sources. So yeah. some people can do okay for a period of time on a plant-based diet, but, um, there's a lot of factors that play into that. So their age, their overall health, uh, whether or not they're battling like an immune autoimmune uh, mm -hmm. disease, uh, there are genetic factors that might make it easier for somebody. So for example, half of humans, about half, um, can't convert beta carotene into vitamin A. So mm -hmm. beta carotene is the vitamin A, the quote unquote right. vitamin A that you would find in a sweet potato. But um, m m a lot of people don't make that conversion over to the active form of vitamin A that we need. Um, and so, you know, depending on your, your genetics, you may find yourself vitamin A deficient on a plant-based diet. They can't get that. It has to be retinol already in the meat, essentially. Yeah. Yes. Right. So getting, getting your vitamin A from, um, an animal source guarantees that you're getting it already converted into the proper form. Gotcha. So this could really come into play. We're seeing more and more, uh, of this ideology coming into schools, like you mentioned, uh, school contracts with Pepsi, Kellogg's and whatever other grain based, you know, sugar based uh, corporation is, is selling the food there. And so uh, the the effect on developing, well, let's say, let's just, we can start with babies, but children and a lack of the meat and these nutrients. I mean, you guys dig into that quite a bit as well. I think it's, it's significant, isn't it? Uh, I mean, for more so for developing humans. Yes. So there's only been one randomized control trial that's looked at um, meat in kids. And um, so one, it was done in Kenya. One group got uh, meat, extra meat. One group got just extra calories. And the third group got extra milk. And mm. the meat group 
far outperformed the other two groups in every category. So they were assessing on behavior, on um, academics, and then on uh, physical. And so uh, interestingly, the second best group was the over calorie group. Uh, hmm. The worst group was the milk group. And I think that that's also significant because a lot of places are substituting milk for meat mm. and it is not a suitable substitute for uh, animal, animal flesh. It's just not. Um, and so it's, it's not enough to just give extra milk. We actually have to be giving kids animal source proteins. Um, mm. There's other, there's been other studies where, you know, you give a kid just an egg a day and watch what happens. Um, and it's, it's pretty magical. So, um, you know, these programs that we're seeing right now that are pretty much just virtue signaling that are pulling meat out of schools, right. um, there's no evidence to show that that will result in better health outcomes for the kids. And also it ends up teaching kids that meat is a bad thing. And that's a problem. Uh, I have a huge problem with that because iron deficiency uh, is uh, iron and B12 are two of the most common nutrient deficiencies worldwide and animal source foods are the best source of, of those nutrients. And so uh, to tell kids that, you know, the burger is bad and they should eat beans and rice instead is actually, I, I see a big ethical problem with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they're just not going to be given the nutrients that they need. It's, it's way beyond even the protein too. It's, I mean, it's those mm -hmm. minerals those, and those vitamins like A, D, E, K, the B vitamins, zinc, all the things and then in the fats are even necessary too for brain development and hormone development exactly right choline and, and cholesterol um so a lot of people will argue well you can supplement with those right you can supplement there's lots of iron supplements and lots of vitamin supplements and so mm -hmm. i mean what if you talk about bioavailability of supplements to meat is there a comparison no, there is not. Um, you, it's much better to get the food in a real food source. And mm -hmm. there's also, um, I think, ethical considerations with telling people that they shouldn't eat a food product because you're uncomfortable with it and they should go take a supplement instead. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody has access to iron tablets and B12 supplements, uh, especially in developing countries. So we feature that in the film. Um, you know, we show that uh, in developing countries, you know, where in places, many of these places, only animals will do well anyway. You can't just go crop everywhere. Um, there might be water restrictions or poor mm. soil, something like that. Oh, sorry. Right. My phone rang. Um, uh, and so um, people need to be getting their nutrients directly from their food. That is the best way to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and animals have always been critical for our brain health, for our physical health and, uh, the most valuable food source that we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, if you think about, it, you mentioned developing countries, but even, even in the U S with, um, a certain below a certain poverty level, you can imagine if you take away meat from certain families, children, or what, even what they're getting in school, so they may take away the meat in school. They're not giving them supplements and the food they're eating is certainly isn't, I mean, other than a fortified cereal or some vitamin D added to their strawberry or chocolate flavored milk full of sugar. They're, they're not going to have, many of these kids are not going to have access to these supplements. Yeah. They're expensive, a lot of people. And so they end up substituting even, and, and elderly as well. They end up, in my opinion, I would think they end up substituting junk food just to fill bellies. Yes, uh, exactly. It's, um, you know, and in, uh, there's, you know, the government programs are also pretty low on meat or um, non-existent on meat. So for example, WIC, Women, Infants right. and Children, there's no meat available on, on that program. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, we have a very, you know, systemic bias against animal protein, animal flesh in our culture. Um, so we dive into that a little bit too in the book that sort of that um, our cultural bias against meat, what it represents and, and how, how it's become a scapegoat really for our um, fears about the environment and our failing health. Oh yeah, let's definitely get into that. I just want to, one thing I know it's kind of, I won't say controversial, but it tends to trigger people. Certain people is the difference between grass-fed and 
and grain fit grain or grass finished grain finished. And one thing you guys point out is there's almost no nutritional difference to between the two. And there's, there's a difference in how the animal may have been raised, which is an ethical concern that should be certainly, you know, considered, but, um, you guys said there's, there's really very little nutritional difference between a grass finished and a grain finished because they, they all start off on grass. That's correct. Yeah. A lot of people think that, um, you know, uh, feedlot cattle spend their whole lives on feedlots and that's, oh. and that's not true. Right. Um, and because of how their digestive process works, um, it, most of their lives anyway, the cattle that are finished on feedlots, um, most of their diet is, is grass and, and other fibrous things that, that we can't eat. It's not like it's hundred percent grain. Um, that is the case with chickens and, and, um, in the pork industry, but not right. with cattle. Um, and so when you're looking at the differences between grass finished and feedlot finished cattle, um, there are very slight differences, um, but not enough for me to say, don't eat feedlot beef if you can't afford grass fed beef. I still mm. think, um, you know, beef is about 30% more nutrient dense than chicken. Mm. Um, one cow can provide 500 pounds of meat almost. Uh, think about how many chickens you'd need to kill for that. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and even um, ethically, I think that uh, cattle and feedlots, at least they're, they're moving around, they're not in cages. Um, you know, there's, there's clearly better ways that we can be treating them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on a board of, of an animal welfare group, you know, trying to help with that. Um, but uh, compared to chicken and pork, uh, when you're looking at just, you know, what the average person can afford, what they should be eating, um, I definitely would recommend beef, like as a clinician, right? So mm -hmm. a, a doctor would never say, well, if you can't, if you can't get organic broccoli, don't eat broccoli. They would never say that. And so, um, but it's funny how I get um, a lot of crap for saying that about meat. Um, I still think people should, you know, choline is choline. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Um, from animal source foods and uh, eggs are a really good source of that. Free range eggs, pasture raised eggs are significantly healthier sure. um, than uh, battery raised chicken eggs. Um, it's just not the case when you look at beef. Right, and that has to do with their digestive system, right? This is attributed to their ruminant base mm -hmm. for the cartridges in their, or partitions in their stomach, right? Uh, so they just have a better way of, they, they're better at taking the nutrients out of the plant food than say a chicken or a, pig because they have the ruminant um, digestive yeah, system. So actually cattle are upcycling nutrient poor food into nutrient dense food. So they can graze on land that we can't crop and they can convert food that we can't eat into nutrient dense protein. So chickens and pigs can't do that really because they're monogastric animals or omnivores. Um, cattle are unique in that they can graze on marginal land um, so most of our agricultural land is actually only suitable for grazing. It's, it's not cropping. And so if we weren't to graze cattle on that land, it's not like we could just go plant more pea protein fields or something like that. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, great. Well, I, that's, um, I think, uh, the next, you know, th the question of ethical is, is how it's affecting the environment. I think that seems to be the biggest push right now. Mm -hmm. um, and what you said earlier, you know, you can't grow plants without animals effectively. We're doing it synthetically at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's apparently destroying the cropland. Am I correct? The, the, yes. The current methods. So, so how would having cattle change the, what we're doing now as far as growing plants? So farming in general. What is the solution there? How does that, how do those work together? Well, I don't think this is all going to happen, you know, uh, tomorrow. So no, uh, right. there's baby steps, but um, when we look at um, the way wild herds of animals move in nature, um, we don't see them clustered in the same uh, pasture day in and day out, right? They're constantly moving to get fresh pasture and also to avoid predator pressure. So mm. there might be a wolf or a coyote in the woods. And so they have to keep on moving to, you know, get away from them. Um, in this way, grasslands actually have co-evolved with ruminant animals because 
they need that intense grazing, but then they need rest so that they're, it's not overgrazed. Um, but they also, they have to be grazed. They can't just have no animals chewing on the grass because the chewing actually stimulates root growth. Their manure brings new nutrients to the soil. They're spreading moisture from nearby ponds, um, you know, mm -hmm. all over. And so there's a sort of um, important relationship between the ruminant and the grassland and they, they need each other. It's not, it's not like the cattle are harming the, the grassland um, when they're raised properly. And so there's uh, this way of moving cattle that is similar to what you might um, see in the, the Serengeti with the wildebeest, right? Where, um, or what the bison did in North America before we got rid of the bison. That um, you basically, instead of allowing the animals constant access to the same uh, pasture day in and day out for the whole season, mm -hmm. you partition it into smaller past paddocks. And then you actually are moving the cattle. Um, you know, some of them, some people do it every single day. Some people do it multiple times a day. Uh, it all depends on where you are and how many animals you have and the carrying capacity, the, the forage quality of your pasture. But when you introduce intensive pressure, the animals are eating everything they can, they can get to. So they're not just selectively grazing their favorite grasses and plants, gotcha. right? So they have to eat, they're mowing every single thing down. And then when you move them, that land is now recovering. It's, um, it's attracting wildlife and uh, it, that's how the carbon actually gets sequestered. It's in, in the soil from that die off period with the roots and then them growing back again. Um, so it's, uh, we have some really great graphics in the film that animate this and show this a lot better than I can describe it to your listeners. Um, and also we, we talk about it more in the book, but. Sure. Um, so it's a life cycle that's existing. I mean, it's just a, it's an existing cycle that has already functioning. It's been functioning from the beginning. We've, disrupted it, so to speak. I mean, we- Yes. Yep. So farmers can act like wolves um, by using electric fencing to, uh, to push the animals into a new section. And mm -hmm. then we can control the populations by harvesting some of the animals and eating them. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to keep the land healthy, to keep it covered so it's not being plowed because plowing actually releases carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and you don't need chemicals in this process. Um, so, you know, typical crop based agriculture relies on a lot of chemicals, a lot of, a lot of fossil fuels, uh, a lot of plowing and, um, you know, heavy machinery to grow something that, you know, it, it will last a long time. Corn lasts a long time. We, you know, these, these crops are storable, but they get, turned into ultra processed food that is not helping us um, right. uh, from a health perspective. And it happens to be destroying the environment as well. So it, it, I don't think people are gonna stop eating wheat and corn and soy tomorrow. Um, this, these farming practices are gonna keep on going, but I do think we can increase the amount of uh, regenerative style grazing that's happening um, currently in our, even in the feedlot cattle, uh, situation because these animals are still grazing for most of their life anyhow. Right. Well, there are some, there's some regenerative farms, thankfully, like uh, white oak pastures. Mm -hmm. I think there's another one that one of you sit on the board of, um, it's in Texas, maybe I can't think of the name. Um, I think it's, uh, oh, it's, uh, it's not Joel Selton, but, um, uh, Alan Savory, Polyface, Polyface. Polyface. Oh, that's in Virginia, Virginia. Okay. So, I mean, there's several, there's this concept is being has, has living experiments. Basically they're going on where they are doing this regenerative farming. Like you said, they're restoring the soil. They're putting nitrogen, they're, they're putting carbon back in, but they're not having to spray nitrogen on like so many farms mm -hmm. are there. They're getting it from the animals, like from mm -hmm. the, the urine and the manure and, and then the, like you said, the cycle that, that follows that. Um, so it's, and it's function, it's working, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, the, and there are some studies coming out. I mean, it's difficult to study because um, what works in Virginia might not work in Nevada. Right. And sure. so 
Um, it, it's a difficult, because it's so adaptive to the environment, it's very difficult to replicate exactly in, mm -hmm. in every context. Uh, but there was a life cycle assessment done at White Oak Pastures, that's a farm in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and what they found was that the carbon sequestered greatly offset the, the carbon emissions from the cattle, the methane that came from these um, oh. burping cows. It's, it's not farting cows, it's burping cows. Burping, that's right. Um, but they actually found that for every Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger you eat, you would actually have to eat a grass-fed burger from White Oak Pastures to offset your emissions. Like that's how, that's so how- So they create as many emissions? As, as a, they create as, so the Beyond or Impossible Burger creates as many emissions as the, as a regenerative raised burger puts back in. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. And it's not just about emissions too. I mean, we, we dive into that pretty quickly in um, the film and in the book, but um, you know, there's ecosystem function. There's the ability for the land to absorb water better. And mm -hmm. um, that happens when you have spongy soil that's from, you know, good grazing. So there's, there's water, there's um, conversion of nutrient poor foods, nutrient dense foods. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, wildlife habitat, right? So um, we're losing, uh, birds are going extinct across North America from cropping because we've gotten rid of their food source. We've gotten rid of the insects because we're spraying insecticides. Right. Uh, and so birds can't thrive in a cornfield or a soy field, right? They need their regular wild habitat. Right. Uh, that habitat can be man maintained on a ranch that's actually raising cattle in a regenerative way. And so in the film, we actually show a ranch down in Chihuahua, Mexico, where um, he and a collective of farmers are regenerating over a million acres of desert back into grasslands, which is what it used to be. And they're seeing these returns of all kinds of um, really rare birds that are, that are finding habitat on their ranches. And so they're, they're working with bird organizations. Um, Audubon Society has a uh, regenerative beef certification so you can be bird friendly beef. Um, mm -hmm. They have recognized, and I, I did a podcast with the Audubon Society, um, they have recognized the benefits of this style of ranching to bring back bird populations. And so wow, it's just, it's, it's not just emissions that we're talking about, it's, it's overall sure. ecosystem function. The whole ecosystem, the whole life cycle. That is <laughs> like, again, we've, we've disrupted, we've started partitioning, we're putting farming over here and cattle over here. And I think you guys maybe give an example of just letting the, the cows go through a, a cornfield after it's been harvested yep. and let them eat the husk and eat what's left, what's food, you know, plant matter that we wouldn't touch. You know, we're just going to plow it back in and they can eat it, turn it into nutrients. The manure regenerates the soil, puts nitrogen back in the soil, puts carbon back in the soil. And then and as opposed to spraying it with a, the nitrous oxide, which is actually much more heat uh, containing or heat capturing um, than any, than, than methane, as far as on a scalable, as far as an amount, you know, compared to say methane or um, mm -hmm. CO2, there's far more uh, a heat containing gas from in, in, in the nitrogen that they're spraying on those that gets emitted. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's going back to old fashioned farming is what it sounds like. I mean, it's it's a little bit of old fashioned farming. Um, it's with more knowledge. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, it's kind of a mix of of using modern technology and um, and and really just mimicking nature, natural cycles. Gotcha, mm -hmm. gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. When, when once upon a time, we had you know farmers would grow if they're growing their own crops, they might take some to the the fair or sell off some, but they they had what they needed, but they had a little bit of everything, right? They had a little bit of they had eggs and chickens, they had pork, they had beef, they had a crop or two. And it worked because of that, that cycle, right? I mean, they, they had the bugs, they had the birds, they had everything being attracted to it. It just kind of, it's, it's, um, it's, it's amazing that, that the scientists that are telling us, like at Harvard and so forth, they're, they're, they're telling us that we're not, we don't need meat in our farming cycle, we should be growing more crops. They can't, how do they not recognize a life cycle 
that has existed on this planet long before <laughs> long before we were farming this country for for sure i mean how is that where what is driving this what did you guys find was driving this narrative i mean impossible burger if impossible burger and beyond burger create more emissions than a than a well-raised cow uh burger what i mean that's not that is not the message that's coming out yeah, but they'll say that well, it's it's not being it's not being done at scale. So you know we're the solution. But what I'd like to push back on is that you know that's what they used to say about organic, and just because organic it was a you know when it first came out was a very small niche um, in the marketplace, it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. It just means not enough people are doing it yet, right? right. And so that's the same uh, as what I feel like with the regenerative ranching that um, yes, it's it's not that common right now, um, but it's that doesn't mean all meat is bad and unhealthy. It just means that we need better ranching. Right, at scale. We can just scale the good things. It, and it can be done at scale. Can be done at scale. And that's what you guys find. I love that your blog is sustainable dish. I mean, it's that's, that's in there. A lot of people may not catch that, but it's like, it's sustainable on a large scale for people to, um, like you said, if there's an ethical concern or just an environmental concern, it, it can be accomplished um, at scale. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys show that, you do show that in the book. Um, it's, it's, um, it's refreshing <laughs> to see all of that science in one place. It's, and again, you guys don't say, you just should be eating meat. It's not a carnivore book by any no. stretch. It's not about just eating meat. It's just that, meat is good for us. We need it. It's, it's good all the way around. It's good for us. It's good for the planet. And this narrative um, about not needing, I mean, was it, are we, are we seeing it being profit driven? I mean, what do you, there's a, there's a lot of reasons there. There's, a, you know, people are coming at this from an ethical perspective and, you know, really disturbed by how animals are being factory farmed today. I get that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no death happening on plant-based farms because there is. Um, right. And so um, in the film, Lear Keith, uh, one of our experts says, you know, do we want to be the death that's ruining everything? Or do we want to be the death or do, that's part of the cycle of life and that's actually increasing uh, biodiversity? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, death is going to happen one way or the other. It's just, you know, A, do we want to admit it? And two, do we want to make sure that that death happened in a good way and for a good reason. Well, absolutely. Well, but well, and then from um, environmental, we think about fossil fuels, uh, plant-based, how many plants do we have shipped to the US from another location? And not even just shipped across yeah. the US, shipped from a tropical environment in the winter, we're eating off season produce. Right, right. Um, and as you mentioned, the fossil fuel use and, and emissions of a fake meat, yeah. you know, there's, there's your, your you've got, uh, there's in meat, there's one ingredient in, in a beyond burger, you, you run out of fingers before you finish counting right. the ingredients. And most of them are, are, some are chemical, some are lab and some are grown with, with lab help. Um, but it doesn't make, it, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up for the environment for simplicity for, um, and, and I would, I would, I would think there's gotta be some profit motivation or some tie there. There is, there is. there's more profit in, in, um, ultra processing something than producing a raw ingredient for sure. So there's definitely profit. A lot of Silicon Valley, you know, is investing heavily in these fake meat products and in lab, the, the promise of lab meat, which is also, um, something that's pretty misguided. Um, so I, I think people are coming at this from different places. Um, it's also hard for professors who have published a lot of studies to then change their position. Um, mm. And, you know, people, a, a true scientist should constantly be questioning their bias and hypothesis. Um, but that doesn't really happen a lot in, in academia. Um, right. We actually interviewed Walter Willett for the film and he's in the film. So he's, he's the, um, yep. Uh, and there's wow. a great quote from him saying, you know, farmers have known for thousands of years, if you want to fatten up an animal, you put them in a pen where they can't move around and you feed them lots of grains. 
And humans are like that too. He literally said that. And I have, wow. I have a release from him. Um, so, uh, slipped out, did it? <laughs> what's Slip, that slipped out did it yeah um so um the, people know people know that you know a heavily grain-based diet is not ideal um and uh there's just you know the bias against meat is really strong and it's sort of systemic it's 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 um it's something that's going to take a long time to um undo Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you guys have, are off to a fantastic start. And I think I can't wait. This is going to be a great tool. Like you said, the movie or the documentary is going to be a great uh, tool for that. It's very, very much more consumable than a, than a book for, for young, especially for mm -hmm. younger um, watchers. Is there anything else um, that we could, that you want to express or just kind of describe that I didn't, maybe didn't touch on? I tried. To um, <laughs> well, I, you know, my battery is at 5% now, so, okay. um, but this is good timing. Um, I would just add, you know, that the, the book is really meant to be a companion to the film. So if you like the film and you want to dive into these things more, the, the book is really um, science-based and mm -hmm. well-cited and um, written for people who don't have a PhD in soil science. Um, we tried mm -hmm. to write it in a more kind of conversational way. Um, we do have a diet prescription in there that just focuses on nutrient density and kind of takes emotion out of the equation. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have also available online, we'll have the um, extended interviews and we, Rob and I developed a course called Meet Curious. Um, mm -hmm. if for people that learn better from courses, uh, they, can, they can just take our course and we walk everyone through um, in a PowerPoint style, uh, you know, all the, all the reasons why cattle have been unfairly vilified. So that's a great resource, especially for someone who's kind of uncomfortable about oh. meat eating. Um, is that at sacredcow.com? Mm, sacredcow.info. Dot info. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Sacredcow.info. So, that's um, it. Yeah, so I hope people take advantage of the free screening. I think that uh, it might help with um, those uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner conversations that always come up with, you know, your plant-based sister-in-law or something like that from across <laughs> the table. Um, so we're just hoping that, you know, this actually brings the real food community together and um, yes. need less polarization and more understanding that we're really all fighting for the same thing. Yeah, your message was definitely whole food. It was like mm -hmm. it's just it's just not processed food. It's whole food of of all kinds, of colorful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, how can people find? I know you got sustainabledish.com. Is that yeah? Sustainabledish.com is my nutrition blog. Okay. Um, that has uh, and people can find out how to work with me on that blog. Um, absolutely. And I have recipes and things like that. And then uh, sacredcow.info is. The Sacred Cow Project with the book and the film and a lot of resources for that. We have a discussion guide too, if anyone's a teacher and wants to show it in their school. Oh, um, and awesome. then I'm very active on Instagram at Sustainable Dish. At Sustainable Dish, yes, that's where I was able to reach you, I, I, and which I so appreciate. Um, love your content. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know you're you're busy with all this coming out and, and with the documentary screening and, and, um, and I look, I look again, look forward to seeing it, but thank you for your time. And, thank you. Uh, I hope to, uh, to share this with everybody I can. I'm going to, I'm going to have to get my kids watching it as well. I mean, they're all, they know I'm, a, a, they, they, they kind of, they know I'm, uh, uh, meat driven and I've, I've had a, some influence on them, but it's nice to have another, um, advocate, so to speak, mm -hmm. who isn't mom or dad saying yeah. this is why you need to eat this food and and present it in a way that is like you said it's it's more palatable in a in a film form you know not not here 13 year old try to read this book but you know let's hey, watch this with me for an hour and a half and we'll get some you know so that's awesome i, I love what you guys are doing um thank you absolutely i will uh make sure we have your your links there in the show notes and so they can reach out to you and, and hold to you for uh for more information thank you so much